All right, good to see everyone tonight. Welcome to the Wednesday night service. Good to have you in church this evening. Take your Bible this evening if you would. Go to John chapter 1. We'll continue our study tonight again of the disciples of Jesus. <clears throat> and we get to study the one named Philip this evening. I was going to do Peter, but uh, I'm not going to get Peter done in one session, I don't believe. Uh, there's obviously more material on him than any of the twelve. And uh, so I, uh, with not being here next week, I uh, didn't want to do part of him now and put it off for two weeks. So we'll wait till we have consecutive weeks together to do Peter. Not that you remember for one week to the next anyway, but it, I'll just if, uh, let me dream, okay? And uh, we'll do that. I, I know how that works. All right, John 1, and look with me at verse number 43. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now Father, we ask you to add your blessing to the reading of this scripture and other scriptures that we'll turn to tonight in learning and, and gleaning some truth from the life of this follower of yours and a disciple named Philip. And so, Lord, open our understanding. <coughs> Help us to have ears to hear what the Spirit would want to say to each of us tonight as we look at the life of this man whom you chose to be your follower. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Well, the list of disciples, wherever you find it in any of the Gospels, Number five on the list, the fifth name on the list, is always Philip, without exception. Uh, he would be considered the leader of that second group of four. As we talked about the first four, the second four, and the third four, uh, he would be considered the leader of that second group. Philip is a Greek name. Uh, it means a lover of horses. That's real, uh, not real spiritual there about it, I guess, but, uh, but there will be horses in heaven. Uh, we're going to ride them coming back with Jesus one day. Uh, Revelation tells us about that. And uh, Philip uh, probably had a Jewish name, but it's never given uh, in Scripture. You see, there's, he's always referred to by his Greek name of Philip. In the Greek civilization, it had spread uh, with the conquerors and the conquests of Alexander the Great. It, and, and even many in the Middle East had adopted the language and the culture of the Greeks. And those Jews then were called Hellenist Jews. And they had adopted the Greek culture and the Greek language. Remember in the early church in Acts chapter 6, when some widows were being neglected, they were the Greek widows. They were the Hellenist widows that had, that had come into the church and been saved. And they were being neglected in the administration. And so this would be the group that Philip would be associated with. Now, Look, don't confuse him with the Philip you read about in the book of Acts, who was the first deacon, and then was the Philip who led the Ethiopian eunuch to the Lord in Acts chapter 8. That's a different Philip, okay? And not, not this Philip. And uh, this Philip was from Bethsaida. That's the same city of Peter and Andrew, and James and John. So, James, John, Peter, Andrew, Nathaniel... They were probably all friends and knew one another long before Jesus called them to be His followers. So they had a companionship and a friendship before they all became followers of Jesus Christ. Now it's interesting, everything we'll, you'll see tonight, everything we learn about Philip is found in the Gospel of John. Uh, he's in the list of disciples in Matthew and Mark and Luke, but no details, no, no stories, nothing that involves Philip. Only John gives us those details about Philip. Now, Philip was a very factual person. Some of you tonight, no doubt, are going to see yourself in Philip. He was a, he was a go by the book kind of guy. Okay? If you ever worked in a place where someone, it seems like not only the go by the book, they probably carried one with them and could uh, pull out the section and the, the, the statute and the ordinance that you're supposed to be going by or the procedure that's, that's supposed to happen. Um, 
You know, you heard the expression, think outside the box. Philip always thought inside the box, way inside the box, okay? That was Philip, okay? He was just very cautious that way. And Philip would be more likely to find reasons why it can't be done than reasons why it can be done, okay? That's just Philip's personality, okay? So we're going to learn a little bit about this fellow and how God, Jesus, began to develop him as a follower of his. Number one on your paper is the finding of Philip. And that's what we read tonight in John 1 and verse 43 through 46. The finding of Philip. Jesus meets Philip the day after he is called Andrew, John, and Peter. Notice what it says in verse 43. The day following, that's the day following that he met Andrew and, and, and uh, John and Peter. Now, the day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and, what's the next two words, church? He findeth Philip. Okay? That's the first time that's ever mentioned. The other disciples were all directed to Jesus by John the Baptist. He, they were followers of John, except Peter, of course. Andrew went and found him and brought him to Jesus. The other two had been followers of John. And when John said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, they stopped following John and started following Jesus. Here's the first one, Philip, who Jesus finds him. And we know the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Some of you are old enough to remember there was a movement in the early 70's. It was called, I Found It, or I Found Him. And it was a group that talked about how they found Jesus. And, and the truth of the matter is, you didn't find Jesus, He found you. You're the one, we're the ones who are lost. We're the ones that, that are, remember we talked about the lost sheep? Why do sheep get lost? Sheep have no sense of direction at all. That's why you, you, can, you, can, you can let that cat out miles away. She'll find her way home. But a sheep won't. A sheep will not find its way home. A sheep has no sense of direction. That's why the shepherd had to go get the sheep. And when, the, when, he, brought, when he found it, he, he broke the leg and put it on his shoulder and carried her back. Because it's not, gonna, it's not even going to follow you home. You, it just has zero sense of direction. So we're really not looking for Jesus. We're not trying to find Him. He finds us. That's the truth of the matter. Now, it, it didn't appear that way to Philip. You notice what he said to Nathaniel? When Philip, verse 45, findeth Nathanael, he saith to him, We have found him, of whom Moses and the law and the prophets write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, in Philip's eyes, he found Jesus. So, uh, am I going to believe that Jesus found him or that he found Jesus? Well, the truth is, uh, it's, it's both true. We, we think we found it. Uh, uh, but the truth is, Jesus was looking for us. We're not looking for him. And that's the way it is in, in the Scripture. And so, I believe Philip had an eager heart. I believe he had a hungry heart. I believe that uh, he was, uh, had searched, I believe, the Old Testament Scriptures. And you see that by what he said to Nathaniel. He told Nathaniel, notice what he said, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and in the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Somebody's been reading the law and the prophets and studying the Old Testament. It was Philip. And Philip evidently talking to Nathaniel. And he said, hey, you know what we've been reading about? You know what we've been studying about? I talked to this guy. I, he's here. We've met him. He's here. And it's Jesus of Nazareth. And of course, that's when Nathaniel, and we'll talk more about this when we get to him, when he said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? <laughs> he didn't believe that could be possible. But they were seeking, and they were ready to meet Jesus. And, and, and he was, he was, Philip was eager to, to know who Jesus was. But the other thing I want to point out about his finding Jesus, Jesus finding him, or the finding of <coughs> Philip, is that we see a, the, the biggest characteristic of someone who has truly come to know Jesus Christ is seen here with Philip. As soon as he knows who Jesus is, and he has accepted Him as the Messiah, he has a great desire to go tell somebody else. He has a great desire. The one, probably the best friend he had in the world was Nathaniel. And so he said, man, I've got to go tell Nathaniel the good news. I found Jesus Christ. I found the Messiah. I have eternal life. My sins are forgiven. Man, you've got to know Jesus. That's a great indication. You've got something, my friend. 
I, I've never known a, a Christian, someone who's truly born again, someone who truly knows Christ as their Savior, who is ashamed to tell someone else about it. Boy, that's quiet. Hmm? No, 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 no. It's never, sometimes you knock on the door and you ask somebody if they, if they died, they go to heaven, or have you ever, well, have you ever received Jesus Christ as your Savior? And they say, well, that's a, that's a, a private matter. And I always tell them, I said, well, I'm, I'm sorry about that, but it's not a private matter because Jesus told me to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That means it's no longer a private matter. Now, it is a personal matter. And you personally must accept Christ as your Savior. But it's not private. Anybody who personally knows Jesus Christ as their Savior isn't willing to keep it private to himself. Well, tell somebody else about it. Man, it, there's lesser things than that that we get excited about and tell someone else about. Hey, if there's free pizza given away at, at, down at the pizza store, we're calling everybody up. We know, hey, free pizza today. Go get it. How can we get excited and tell somebody about free pizza and not be excited and tell someone about Jesus Christ and salvation that we have in Him? Oh, there's always an immediate burden to tell somebody who we love and care about about Jesus Christ. We don't want to see them die and be separated from God and spend eternity in hell. Friendships are the most fertile soil for soul winning. Friendships are the most fertile soil for soul winning. Who did Andrew go get at first one he went and got? His brother, Simon Peter. Philip goes and gets his best friend, Nathaniel. Also called Bartholomew, by the way, and gets him to come to Jesus Christ. So that's the finding of Philip. Secondly, the second time, next time we read about Philip is over in John chapter 6. Would you look over there? A familiar story to us. We know it as what we call the feeding of the 5,000. Let me take a quick drink here. Maybe keep my throat moist. It'll stay up with it a little bit, all right? So we have John 6 here in the feeding of the, what we call the 5,000 here. Jesus, in verse number 5, When Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto who? Philip. Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him. For he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. And one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said unto him, There's a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about five thousand. Jesus took the loaves. When he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. And when they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them which had eaten. Then these men, those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth that prophet that should come into the world. Well, here's 5,000 men. I suppose if you counted the women and the children, you could easily have 10,000, maybe 15,000 uh, of the crowd that day. Wouldn't be out of the question. And, and here's Jesus, all these people, his 12 disciples, and he's going to turn and say, okay, it's, it's supper time. We've got to feed these people before they go home. Who do you think he's going to ask how are we going to feed these people? He's going to ask Philip. Out of those 12 guys, you think maybe the first one to speak up might have been Peter. He was always seeming to talk first and have an idea on his head. But it wasn't. It was Philip. And uh, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe Philip was the administrator of the group. Maybe Philip was uh, in charge of logistics. You know, he, he was in charge of making the arrangements and Maybe he, now Judas held the bag, he was the treasurer, but maybe it was Philip that arranged meals and places to meet and things to go and the travel plans and he just had that kind of a mind. And so maybe, and by the way, Jesus said, he asked, him, he asked Philip that to what? 
prove him, to test him. That's what a proving is. Uh, the proving grounds where the cars get tested. Okay, And so he's testing Philip. Because he knows this. He knows what Philip's thinking. And Philip was already thinking. Because what did Philip answer? 200 penny worth of bread is not enough to feed all these. Even everybody has just a little bit. He had already been calculating in his head, how could we make this work? I figured Jesus is going to want to feed these people. How in the world are we going to make this happen? And he's trying to figure it out and, and, and go through it in his own head of how much it would work and how much would be needed to take care of it. Uh, 200 penny worth, it, it not, wouldn't be sufficient even if anybody just had a morsel. There's two things this, this shows us. It shows us a deficiency in finances. You know, following Christ was not making them wealthy in the world. Despite Jesse Duplantis, following Jesus isn't about making you wealthy. In case you didn't know, he's a charismatic evangelist who wants his followers to give money to him so he can buy a $54 million jet. It's his fourth one. He's got three others. That's not, that's not the kind of Christianity Jesus knew anything about. And so, uh, it doesn't, hey, while it doesn't build up any wealth in the world, I tell you where it does build up wealth, it builds up wealth in eternity. You lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven. And that's where the, the true wealth is. But what it also shows is, listen to me, the deficiency of the world to meet the need of mankind. Nothing the world has will be sufficient to meet the need of mankind. What is, what is, man, what is mankind's seemingly always their answer to any problem is throw money at it. We either throw money at it or we throw education at it. Those are the two answers that they always have for everything. And it's always insufficient to help mankind and to meet the need of mankind. There, there wasn't enough money among all of them to feed everybody just a little bit. And neither can the world satisfy the need in mankind that only Jesus Christ can fill. You can try everything else they want, but nothing's going to satisfy you. Nothing's going to fulfill you like your relationship with Jesus Christ. Nothing else will do. Many worldly programs that fall in the 200 penny worth category. AA, NA, psychiatry, psychology, welfare. You go, they do their best to provide. They do their best to give out to the people, but it always falls short. It never does satisfy. It never does fully meet the need. Why did the prison system come to the faith-based programs and say, we got to have you in the prison because we're just seeing guys come back again and again and again with another number and another number and another number because we aren't reaching their heart. And if we don't reach their heart, we don't change their life. And who's going to reach their heart? Listen, the, other, the, the, the programs of the world are not designed to reach the inner. They're only designed to change the outer. And if you don't change your heart, you don't get lasting change. And only Jesus Christ can change your heart. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. Guard your heart with all diligence. Out of it are the issues of life. If I want my issues of life to be different, I've got to have somebody different in my heart than my sinful self. So it showed a deficiency in finances. It also, secondly, showed a deficiency of faith. <coughs> Excuse me. Philip's answer showed a real lack of faith in what Christ could do. Instead of thinking, what a great opportunity for Jesus to show this crowd what He can do. He didn't think that. What a, what a great opportunity for a miracle. But he didn't think that. He'd seen them turn water into wine at the wedding in Cana of Galilee. He had seen blind eyes open. He'd seen lame people to walk. 
But looking at the crowd that, that, that evening and looking out over the mass of people, his thinking fell back into his old materialistic way. And you know what his first thought was? It can't be done. It can't be done. Doesn't matter if we had 200 penny worth, that's still not enough to feed these people. Philip was relying on calculations instead of relying on Christ. And don't get too hard on Philip. You and I have been there too. We're facing a need. We're facing a mission trip. You're facing college. You're facing bills due. And what do we do? We calculate. And according to my calculations, it just can't be done. Well, I'm glad the Bible doesn't say that, that, that I can do all things through my calculations which strengthen me. It says I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. It says with God nothing shall be impossible. Not with my calculations nothing shall be impossible. There are people here who can, can tell you there's times you've, you've put it down on paper and you've looked at it and said there's no way we can make it. You know, you, you think about, I thought about Brother Yoder when I was writing this, and, and you know, here's a fellow, what are you at, 40% support? Think about, think about if you needed, uh, needed uh, $2,000 a month to live on and you were bringing in 800 How would you live? Let alone live, how would you live and still be able to take two trips to the mission field and spend several weeks and thousands of dollars to take care of meetings in India and meetings in the Philippines. He didn't do that on calculations. If he just did calculations, he'd never go anywhere. In fact, he'd sit in his house and pull all the drapes and, be, and Mrs. Yoder would be saying, come out from under the bed, Dave. You know? <laughs> That's the calculations. No, who does that? Christ does that. Faith in Christ. He looks at it and says, hey, here's an opportunity to see what God can do. Here's an opportunity for a miracle to take place. What an opportunity Philip had. But the limitless omnipotence of Christ escaped his thinking. He needed to learn. He's learning. He's going to learn that with God, nothing is impossible. You just remove that impossible from your vocabulary. And all things are possible with Christ. So to Him, but when you think, listen, when you think materialistically, when you think with your calculating human mind, it's all impossible. So don't be deficient in faith. What is it that pleases God? Faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. He that, 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 that believes God, he must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So have faith in God. Don't calculate your situation. Go to Christ with your situation. It rubbed off even a little bit on Andrew when he finally brought the boy forward and said, well, i got a boy here with five loaves and two fishes, but what's that among so many? He must have been hanging around Philip. He kind of had the same pessimistic view, didn't he? Well, they found out what that was, didn't they? They found out what that little was when they gave it to Jesus. And he multiplied it, and he got 12 baskets full. And I never, I'll never forget Justin Levine talking about uh, translating the Bible in Nepal. And they came to the, the word baskets here in this particular case. And there, there are five different words in Nepalese. <laughs> I think that's what they call it. Uh, for the word basket. And they're trying to figure out what basket should we use. Everything from a little basket to a large grain basket. And they didn't know which basket word to use for basket to fit in this story. And so they looked and said, well, where else is this word basket used in the Bible? It's only used one other place in the Bible. And it's used in the book of Acts when they were ready to kill Saul and the disciples led him over the wall in a basket. So it's a basket big enough to fit a man into. 
That's a pretty good sized basket, even if it's a small guy. I mean, uh, how, boy, Brother Yoder, seems like I'm picking on you tonight, huh? How, how tall are you? 5'9", Five. Five, okay. And, and that might have been Paul. They said he was short of stature. But if you're going to put Brother Dave in a basket, it better be a pretty good sized basket, even though he's a, he's a smaller guy. But you understand? So they picked up 12 baskets, and you're thinking about that size of a basket. That's quite a bit of food left over. Huh? That's, that's quite amazing. Not, not, and by the way, they all didn't just have a little. The Bible says they ate till they were full. They ate to where they could. Oh, no, no, no more, no more. Hmm? They couldn't take any more. What a miracle. What a miracle. So we see Philip and the feeding of the 5,000. Let's go to the third time we find Philip, and that's John 12. John chapter 12. Are you okay? Everybody all right? John 12. Here we see the seeking of the Greeks. The seeking of the Greeks. This is the Passover in Jerusalem. And verse number 20 of John 12. The Bible says there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. And Philip cometh and telleth Andrew. And again, Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. This will be the final Passover of the Old Testament economy because now Jesus will be the Passover lamb. He will be the lamb that will that'll take away the sin of the world. And the Greeks have come to the Passover here and they're very interested in Jesus Christ. And they want to see Jesus. And and they approach Philip. Probably because of his Greek name. Possibly some of the folks in the group could have known Philip from Bethsaida. And they could have known that he's become a follower of Jesus. And uh, Philip's a Greek name. Let's go ask him. He'll have a heart for us. He's one of us. And, and they ask him to arrange a meeting with Jesus. Now that shouldn't be a real difficult request. But Philip really struggled with it. Maybe he remembered Jesus saying, remember what we said? Philip always thought inside the box. He never thought outside the box. He, he, was, he was by the book. Maybe he remembered Jesus saying, I'm not come but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. When he told the the disciples, he told them, you go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus said, I'm not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so he thought, well, I don't know if Jesus will see these people or not. They're not Jews. They're not the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But if he'd have thought, didn't Jesus speak to the Samaritan woman? Didn't he heal the centurion's servant? Didn't, wasn't there the Syrophoenician woman's daughter? But, but Philip, when he pulled out his protocol book, there was no protocol in it for bringing a Greek to Jesus. So he didn't think it could be done. And so he did what only he knew to do to be safe. He took him to see Andrew. <laughs> and Andrew brought him to Jesus. Because that's what Andrew did every time he's mentioned. Andrew always gets people to Jesus. And they brought him to Jesus, and you can read the rest of what Jesus said to the Greeks, and we won't take time to read that tonight, but but they found out that Jesus' words were true. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. You just come to Jesus. Salvation and Jesus Christ came for everyone. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. So that's, Jesus, that, that's Philip with the Greeks that came and wanted to see Jesus. Then, the last time we see Philip and hear of Philip is John 14. John 14. And this is the questioning in the upper room. The questioning in the upper room. Very familiar passage to us. Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God. <coughs> Excuse me. Believe also in me. 
In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? And Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Here's Philip. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Now we see the questioning in the upper room. Jesus, Jesus' heart is heavy. This will be the last meal He'll have with His disciples, with the twelve. This is is when He eats the meal and then He gets up from the table and and He uh, takes off His outer garment and girds Himself with a towel and goes to the basin and he goes around and washes the feet of his disciples. That basin that sat there through the entire meal, and not one of the disciples was going to be a servant and get up and wash anybody else's feet. So Jesus leads the way. And it's the servant that they should have been. And he washes their feet. He knew his time with these men was coming to an end. He's trying to encourage them. He's trying to comfort them. He's telling them and preparing them for the Holy Spirit that's going to come. Uh, The Comforter, one like Him that would be with them and would dwell in them. And then He promises He'll return for them. And that where He is, there they can be also. Thomas is the first one to speak up and he says, we don't know where you're going and how can we know the way? That's where we get John 14, 6. When Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, no man comes to the Father but by me. The clearest possible language he could give that he's the only way to get to God is through Jesus Christ. You say, well, that's narrow. What about all these people? What about all those people? Listen, it doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter what religion they are. It doesn't matter what nation they're from. If they're going to get to God, they're going to come through Jesus Christ. That's that's as narrow as the Bible's narrow. And that's the message we take. Then Philip speaks. Show us the Father and it sufficeth us. It will satisfy us. And then Jesus says, Have I been so long time with you and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? That's a piercing question, isn't it? But as I read that question, I think, I wonder if God or Jesus could ask that of you or me. Have you been this long time with me and you still don't know me? See, there's a lot of people that know about him, but they don't know him. He says, I've, I, you don't understand that you've been with me 18 months. You've heard me teach. You've seen me cast out demons. You've seen the worst of diseases dismissed. You've been in... in intimate fellowship with Jesus Christ. You understand, they didn't just spend time with Jesus for five hours a day and go home. They lived with Him. They walked with Him. They slept together. They ate together. They were together 24-7. They were always with Him. How could Philip have missed it? Jesus says, Philip, I am one with the Father. What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. It was God in the flesh in Jesus Christ. We share the same divine essence. Believest thou that I'm in the Father and the Father in me? 
Philip, Philip's skepticism, his calculating mind, his trying to figure out all the details and his obsession to details, his small-mindedness, it shut him off from, from really appreciating and enjoying the presence of Jesus Christ. How sad. Philip had a, had a real limited ability. He had a weak faith. In fact, probably if we'd have interviewed Philip for the you know, spot of a disciple, one of the followers of Jesus Christ, we'd have said, no, nah, I don't think you'll make the grade. Uh, I appreciate your time, but uh, we'll, we'll call you if we can use you. Say, you can't, you'd have said, Jesus, you just can't make this guy one of the 12 most important people in the world. You just shouldn't do it. But Jesus would have said, it's exactly who I want. That's exactly who I want. Because my strength is made perfect in weakness. You understand, Jesus didn't go around and pick the, the, the best and the brightest. He didn't go around to the schools and say, uh, give me your valid Victorian to the class. He didn't go around to the wealthy or those who sat at the feet of Gamaliel and say, give me, give me your best students. You know what he did? He got people who the world would look at and say, those guys? The, the book of Acts says the, 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 the religious leaders looked at him and said they were, they were um, uh, ignorant and unlearned men. But they turned the world upside down. Because Jesus said, everybody will know when I choose these guys that it had to be God in them doing the work. God always chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Hey, that's why He chose us. Okay? If you think you're all something and you're all this and you're all that, you won't be used by God very much. God, God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Philip, like, like the other apostles, was put to death about eight years after James. James was beheaded, as you know, in Acts 12. Philip, by the way, uh, Xavier, it says that I, I read that Philip, they thought, went into the Ukraine and up into that part of the world and preached the gospel. He ended up being crucified in Hylopolis, Turkey. Philip and Bartholomew, or Nathaniel, they worked together. They traveled together in preaching the gospel. It's interesting, when they were crucified, they both were crucified upside down, or head downward, as the Greeks called it. Head downward. They said Philip continued to preach while he was on the cross to those who were watching and passing by. You know, most of the crucifixions would be along a roadside or somewhere where it was very public because they wanted people to see what happened to people who didn't go along with the government or didn't go along with what the society wanted. It is said that while Philip preached on the cross, the result was they, wanted to, they, they released Bartholomew. They took him off the cross. Philip insisted that they not release him. And so he died on the cross. So you see, Philip, while faith was difficult, his faith grew. And he was greatly used by God and saw multitudes come to know Christ as his Savior. And because of his questions, we got some great answers from Jesus. I'm glad that John recorded them for us because they help us. And, and he gives us some valuable truths that Jesus is God. And Jesus can do the miraculous. And that we must rely on Christ and not calculations. That God, God is at work and God has a plan for every one of His children. God has a will for every single individual life. God has a will for your life. 
I thank God for Philip. That, that fellow with the Greek name was a follower of Jesus Christ. That's what we learn from the life of Philip. Great follower of Jesus. Let's stand together tonight for prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we bow before you in prayer tonight. Thank you for Philip. Thank you, Lord, for his growth and grace. Thank you for the things we've been able to glean from his life tonight. Thank you, Lord, that when he found you, or rather, you found him, he was immediately concerned to go tell Nathaniel, get him to Jesus. Give us that soul winning zeal that he had, that burden for the loss that he had. Father, as he looked at the, the crowd that day, and he fell back into old thinking, and how there was no way humanly possible that this crowd could be fed. God, save us from that kind of thinking. Help us to always know that with God all things are possible. And help us to walk by faith and not by sight. When people come to us and say, we'd like to see Jesus. Lord, I pray that each of everybody here, every individual would know how to bring another person to Jesus Christ. That each of us would know how to take our Bible and bring someone to Jesus. To place their faith in Him as their Savior. And Lord, I pray that we would know that You and the Father are one. That in Your presence is fullness of joy. That we would not miss the fact that God is with us. Lo, I am with You always, even unto the end of the world. You will never leave us nor forsake us. Lord, we love you tonight. Thank you for Philip. Thank you for his life. Thank you for his testimony that we have been helped by even tonight. I look forward to meeting him one day, sitting down and talking with him, being in his presence for a little bit. Lord, we love you tonight. Dismiss us now with your care. Make us mindful of your presence as we leave this place. May we point others to Jesus this week. And it's in His name we pray. Amen.